Good afternoon and welcome to the State Republican Party Convention in Dallas, Texas. My name is Ben Strusan and I'm Chairman of Americans for Prosperity. And we're broadcasting live from the convention and we've had a great lineup of guests and joining us now is Senator John Cornyn. Senator Cornyn, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate Good to be you with taking you. the time. It's been a great convention and uh, tell us a little bit about what the delegates have told you. I know you're walking amongst the crowd and uh, we're, I can tell we're all energized about what's going on and I think that the current administration probably has a lot to do with that. Well, that's exactly right, Ben. I think people are... Uh beyond concern. They are scared, and I don't blame them, um, given the uh, spending and the debt and the really the, uh, the, the way that uh, the president is apologizing uh, to our enemies and uh, been a very weak uh, partner with our allies. And I think uh, encouraging, emboldening America's enemies and putting us on a financial course that could uh, run us off the cliff. Uh, it's very serious. That's why I think you see a lot of people here today and who've been very involved in politics, some of whom for the first time. It's very, that part is very encouraging. Well, speaking of government intrusion, um, and I know you've been working on this issue, the EPA has recently decided, I guess, to take over the permitting process here in the state of Texas. And I know that uh, in Congress there's a disapproval resolution pending yep. uh, uh, in order to essentially roll that back and turn it back. How's that coming, and uh, what do you think the chances are of success? Well, what we've seen is a trend where they, with the uh, Obama administration and uh, Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi can't get the votes to pass legislation, then what they try to do is do things through the administrative agencies. We've seen that with the FCC and uh, so-called net neutrality, their attempt to basically commandeer the internet. Uh, we've seen it uh, in a number of areas, most recently with the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, knowing that they're going to have problem passing cap and trade, what they're going to try to do, uh, and they've, they've got a, uh, uh, an administrator there who believes that she has the authority to do it without any further legislative action. But I can't think of a worse thing to do when our economy is in recession, when so many people are out of work and people have lost their homes, than to uh, raise prices on energy. Um, it's going to chase a lot of businesses that uh, operate in Texas abroad where they're going to make a rational decision. Where am I going to be able to make a dollar? Where am I going to be, or am I going to be underwater if my prices are too high or political circumstances are too uncertain? So while this administration keeps talking about being concerned about jobs, I keep wondering when they're going to pivot to jobs. All I've seen is one job killing idea after another. Well, uh, I, I also, and you touched on it, wanted to ask you about what's going on in the Gulf. And I, I'm sure, like most Americans, you're concerned about the environmental impact. But how do you feel about the administration's uh, drilling ban and what it is that they, uh, or their reaction to the Gulf oil spill? Uh, I think we in the uh, Gulf states probably are a little more sensitive to drilling bans right. than our uh, fellow citizens up in Maine. Right. Well, the problem, as I see it, is, is twofold. One is we know we have a problem where, because of federal policy, we basically have forced oil companies offshore into high risk uh, high, and uh, in these uh, deep water wells, which are on the cutting edge of technology and, and uh, engineering. And uh, unfortunately, they 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 were. Able they were being, they were moving out so fast. They were uh, kept ahead of the ability of the federal government actually to regulate activities. But if you think about it, you know, so much of the federal lands, uh, you could be drilling for this on shore, where you wouldn't have all the risks of drilling through a mile full of water at those tremendous depths and pressure. And uh, so, a lot of the federal policy in a place now with the moratorium on shore, on drilling in a number of. Uh, on a number of uh, very uh, productive places, places like Anwar, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We've been trying to get them to open that up for years, and unfortunately, the Democrats and some pretty radical environmental groups have, have uh, said, no, we'd, we're worried, more worried about the caribou than we are the, uh, the people. And the truth is the caribou love it. You know, the Alaskan oil pipeline apparently makes great nesting headquarters. 
uh, for nesting area habitat for them. But the problem in the Gulf now, of course, if the president wants to impose a long-term moratorium, it's going to make us more dependent on imported oil from the Middle East and from uh, Venezuela, uh, people who don't like us very much and could use that as a weapon. And it's going to kill jobs. If we have 20,000, I think Governor Jindal in Louisiana said that uh, if you impose a moratorium between now and the end of uh, December, that at least 20,000 people will lose their jobs in Louisiana alone. So it's uh, we need to be very careful here. Everybody gets it. We, we need to know what happened. We need to stop the, the, the spill, make sure it doesn't happen again. But the idea that we're all of a sudden going to start drilling, it's kind of like saying, well, I'm not going to drive anymore because I had a car accident. Yeah. Well, uh, do you believe that, uh, and I, I don't want to let you go without getting on this issue because it's occupied uh, news media and I think uh, has uh, energized Republicans and Tea Party activists, probably created the Tea Party, and that's Obamacare. Uh, how, how do we deal with that as Republicans? Do we try to support a rollback of that? Do we try to modify or change it? I guess at the end of the day, it just appears, uh, depends on what we have the votes to do, does it not? Um, what, what do you think we should do? And as Republicans, how should we position ourselves? Should we just ask for a rollback? Well, two words I would leave with you on Obamacare. It's repeal and replace. Uh, I think everybody understands the importance of health care reform, but I thought health care reform was about making health care more affordable and more accessible. This bill does the opposite of that. It really what it sets up is a situation where they're hoping that gradually private employers will give up their private health insurance and then people will find themselves without any alternative but to go on a government, uh, a government plan. And the problem is we know the existing government plans, Medicare and Medicaid are on a very fiscally unstable basis and represent, uh, in the case of Medicare, $38 trillion of unfunded liabilities. But uh, three things that Obamacare did was, uh, of course, raise taxes to help pay for it. It cut Medicare, particularly Medicare Advantage, the private insurance alternative, the fee-for-service Medicare, and it raised premiums on people with uh, that buy their insurance in the group market. Uh, it is uh, the opposite, again, of what you would think rational decision making would be what it, if, you, if your real concern was uh, how do we make health care more affordable. So repeal and replace. You got it. Uh, Senator, you're uh, chairman of the National Republican Senatorial uh, Campaign Committee. Committee. Right. Uh, how do you think we're going to do in November? You like the crop of candidates that are uh, representing the Republican Party uh, nationwide. Uh, the uh, lady in Nevada, have you had, Sharon, an, opportunity? Yeah, Engel, uh -huh. had an opportunity to meet her? She appears to be a grassroots activist. Absolutely. And, uh, well, what we're seeing in across America is what we're seeing happening here today. And a lot of people, some regulars who've been at it a while, but some new folks who haven't been involved in Republican politics who are worried about the direction of the country, and they are energized, they've gotten off the couch, and they've showed up at tea parties and town halls. We've got some here. And, um, you know, I think that's great. I mean, this is, this is the only way we're going to take our country back. And I'm particularly glad in the Senate, where we now only have 41 Republican senators. Uh, Scott Brown was number 41. Uh, he was elected on uh, January the 19th. But the problem is, if you only have 41, you know, you, you might lose one or two, uh, depending on what the issue is. So if we can get 41 reliable votes in the Senate, then we can stop. President Obama's policies dead in their tracks. Now, of course, in some cases, what we might want to do is use that for leverage to um, uh, to shape it, make it better, and something that would actually be good good policy. Uh, but the first thing I think we need to do is stop really bad ideas. That's why I sit out here today. Uh, I'm proud to be the party of no when it comes to really, really, really bad ideas. <laughs> Well, uh, Senator, thank you very much for joining us. Is there anything else you want to tell our audience or the people listening at home? Well, I'd just say uh, it's exciting to be uh, to be here in Dallas with everyone today. Uh, our country depends on your involvement, and uh, we need a lot more reinforcements, not only in the grassroots effort to get our message out, but to actually get people to the polling places, make sure they get registered and vote. You know, I always like to say that Elections aren't rocket science, but they do take some organization. They do take some, uh, uh, you know, people, 
uh, at the grassroots level, and it, it does unfortunately take some money uh, to pay for the a lot of the communications effort. But we've seen candidates like Sharon Angle, you mentioned in uh, in Nevada, who won that uh, that primary. People like Rand Paul in, in Kentucky, and we're going to be working closely with all of those uh, candidates to make sure we take our country back. Uh, there's too much at stake for us to sit on the sidelines uh, this November. So thanks, all of you, for being here. Thanks, Ben, for what you all are doing. Senator, thank you very much. That was Senator John Cornyn, and we're at the Americans for Prosperity booth live from uh, Dallas, Texas, at the Republican State Convention. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you.